Today, how do the, we as a Seventh-day Adventist see ourselves in relation to the rest of the world? Do we see, does the Adventist church see itself as being called to fulfill a purpose or a mission? Yes, yes no. Yes. Okay. Like the Jews, we're called to prepare the world for the first Advent. At Seventh-day Adventists see their purpose in calling the world to prepare for the second Advent. Would you agree with that? The SDA church shares several elements in common with the Jewish nation, the ancient Israel. They both uh, honor the Seventh-day Sabbath. They both have a sanctuary message. They both have a healthy lifestyle message. They both have an Advent message. They both have the inspired word of God. And what is the purpose of these resources that I just went through here? Sabbath, sanctuary, health message. What was the purpose of them? New Testament, Paul talks about that these were given and they were an advantage to the Jewish people. But the Jewish people didn't take advantage of all that was given them and they ended up rejecting the Messiah and were not ready for his advent. But there was be an advantage in every way to be Jewish because of all these things that they were given. I believe there is an advantage to be an Adventist, Amen. but is the Adventist church very similar to the Jewish nation? Yeah. yeah. Having all these advantages and called for a purpose, yet not necessarily taking advantage of all that was given. So let's, let's talk about the advantages, the purpose of these common resources. The Seventh-day Sabbath, how is it an advantage? It's designed law. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, truly, the Seventh-day Sabbath exists because of creation, ties it straight back to creator, ties it straight back to the laws that creation operate upon, and takes you right back to worshiping him who made the heavens and the earth. And then it, 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 it insulates us and protects us from the Roman imperial lie. And there, there's the physiological, yes, it does that, mental and physiological. Reminder of, of God's is the one who makes us holy. We don't make ourselves holy. We don't have to work for it. It's a gift. So we, we recognize the truth that our creator built reality to operate in harmony with his own character. We recognize the truth that sin is a condition of being out of harmony with that character. We recognize the truth that God sent Christ to fix the condition we couldn't fix. And we recognize the truth and we trust him. The Spirit takes the victory of Christ and puts it in us. And it distresses us and it heals us. It's a tremendous blessing. And then each week it's an opportunity to practice that trust by setting aside our need to make money and, and advance our own interests on this planet, we set it aside each week and trust him with those outcomes. It's an opportunity to practice our trust. And then the sanctuary message. How is this a blessing? What is the purpose of the sanctuary message? To understand Jesus. Only if you first understand? Reality. Reality, which means design, design law. If you understand the Sabbath through Roman law, which many Adventists or Jews did, so it's a system of rules. You got to keep it. You got to have 600 other rules. You got to pin your, your handkerchief to your thing because you can't carry it on Sabbath. You only walk so many steps. You can't, you can't put your elevator. You do the, blah, blah, blah. So it's like the most stressful day of the week. You're not free. You're enslaved if you, if you teach it through imposed law. Same thing with the sanctuary message. If you approach a sanctuary message through an imperial law model, it becomes destructive and corrosive to character, not healing. But if you see it through design law, then you actually understand it's a metaphor, it's a little teaching tool, it's a little theater, which, which is teaching the reality of God restoring in us his living law so that we were who are dead in trespass and sin become living and bring about fruits of righteousness. It's the plan of bringing us back into unity or one with God. And, and uh, we have uh, lectures on our website. For those who don't know, go to our resource section. You'll find a lecture all about the symbolism of the sanctuary and what it teaches. We also have our um, Heavenly Sanctuary in the Modern World pamphlet uh, available to teach what's really happening and how God is healing hearts and minds and preparing us to meet him. What about the health message and life, uh, health lifestyle message that we have? How is that a benefit to us? We live longer. We, live we can think more clearly. We can uh, be an example to others. So, so one immediate benefit is the physiological better health that keeps us uh, more useful for God's cause and clearer minds. Yes. We can serve others. 
serve others, yes. Happiness is a byproduct of healthiness. That's exactly right. Happiness is a byproduct of healthiness in all the domains. So we are happier for healthier. And all these things are true. There's multiple reasons. And one more. It's a revelation of design law. Thank you. It is the most powerful revelation of design law that essentially every person can connect with. You can't have health in the viol by violating the laws of health. And you can't have spiritual health while violating the laws of spiritual health, the moral laws, the design laws. It's all, it's all connected. It teaches. That's why it's the right arm of the, of, the mission, of the mission, of the ministry. What about the Advent message? Why is the Advent message an advantage to us? We can have our priorities. Thank you. We're in the world, but we're... We're, we're, if we keep the truth, if we really believe the Advent is soon, that Jesus is coming soon, it diminishes the value we attach to the things of the world. They become less important, don't they? It increases the value of people. There you go. And it increases the value of people and the need to share the message. But if we believe in Jesus... And I can tell you, I ask my Christian patients uh, when the times are appropriate to ask, um, do you believe in the second coming of Christ? Most of them do in a theoretical sense. Yeah, but it won't happen in my lifetime. It'll happen someday. I'll go to heaven when I die. And most Christians anticipate heaven at their death, not at an immediate return that's eminent in the near future. If you have eyes to see, to discern, you can see the movements are happening, folks. I believe the movements are happening right now. The, the, the beast is, is organizing and, and shaping right now. The Advent message gives us hope in the face of earthquakes, raging fires, uh, climate change, pandemics, uh, coercive governments. The Advent message gives us hope. This is not the end. We have a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. It gives us hope. It gives us perspective. It gives us freedom from the, from the stressors of this world. It, 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 we are sojourners here like the ancients were. We know we have a home and a better land. We long for that better land. And then the inspired record, the inspired word of God. What usefulness is it to us? Do you know there's a real attack on the inspired word? All types of attacks on it. Don't value it. Don't use it. It's all just myth. The written word protects us from mysticism through human experiences and from godlessness through science. When we use the written word, integrating it with human experiences in science, the integrative evidence-based approach, we can discern godly truths because God speaks to us in his written word, he speaks to us in science and nature, and he speaks to us in life experiences. And we have to anchor all of our interpretations into the written word where God reveals himself to us, and he reveals the plan of salvation, he reveals the problem of sin, he reveals how he deals with things through history, he reveals what ha I mean, seriously, the whole thing, we should learn to see the, the word as a whole and compare all the parts to the central theme and how it all fits together. Do you have that vision? It's an incredible perspective. And the written word gives us a platform to discern reality. And then when you see events happening in the world, you can see them in their setting of the great controversy, the two antagonistic principles, because you've anchored yourself in the written word. And you understand certain methods don't, don't, don't get used by God's people, regardless of the intended cause or goal. So when you, uh, let me ask you this question. We'll, we'll, we'll spend just a minute or two on it, and we'll close with this. If someone were to say to you, I understand you're a Seventh-day Adventist, and you have a message for the world, what is that message that the Adventist church is called to take to the world? And you're on an elevator ride. You've got about 45 seconds. What do you tell them? God loves you, God loves you she said. That would certainly be a worthwhile message. 
How would that message be different than John Wesley, who said, what then is the mark? Who is a Methodist, according to your own account? I answer, a Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost given unto him, unto uh, one who loves the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, and all his strength. God is the joy of his heart and the desire of his soul, which is constantly crying, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee, my God and my all. Thou art my strength of my heart and my portion for, forever. So how would that message, God God loves you, be different than John Wesley? And if it's not different than John Wesley, then what's the purpose of the Adventist Church? Do we have something more to share? The character of God, which is God is love, which is the message of Wesley. But what did Wesley not have? My view. Full understanding of God's law. Yes. My view is what makes our message powerful and unique is the truth of God's character of love in the setting of the great controversy, which is the antagonistic governments, God's design law of love and how love functions in the design laws of life, the creator, versus the imperial law of Satan's kingdom of rules over and authority. This is the big difference. And Wesley knew that God was love, and I I love what Wesley wrote. I don't think he had an appreciation of the full implications of the great controversy, nor the design laws of God and how they function. And that, and, and that false assumption, I will just tell you, as long as you still, even though you know God is love, you still live in a world in which you believe his law functions like human law, it perverts, warps, distorts every other teaching in Christianity. You get the explanation of the atonement from people who still operate there. Even though they know God is love and they see the love of Jesus. Well, why did Jesus have to die? You will get some penal, legal dance around. You, you, you ask, well, what, what is hell? What, what is the eternal fires, consuming fire, eternal burning? What is that? You get some dance around. Uh, everything gets warped. It is only when we come back to design law and we present it in this setting, it transcends across all denominational ba- boundaries because it is, the, it is the, the presentation of reality, how reality actually works. And we, when we, and we divest ourselves from this penal legal fantasy, this fraud. So I think we have a tremendous message, and I think it's the message of reality, of God's character, and how he built reality to operate. And each person today is deciding which law they prefer, what methods they'll they'll apply to their life, and therefore what character they develop, and what God they're loyal to. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, and we thank you.